My husband Ray Palmer is back there. Ray Palmer.
So that was all my introduction to art, and then I was in New York, happy. So that's the start of my very long story. These are the chemo dragons because I had breast cancer. I was diagnosed with breast cancer five years ago. Uh, I'm now officially in remission, but I also needed a hip replacement at the time. Could not walk. So I learned how to paint on an iPad, which is something I never thought I'd do. You know, digital art was not something I connected to, but artists <clears throat> find new ways. And the, the dragon was something I really related to because I love dragons my whole life. And my son's room was covered with dragons. And I could just lie back in bed and draw on my iPad and look at the dragons. You know, and get in, and also because I was drawing on an iPad, I didn't want to do something realistic. I do abstract work, I do fantasy work, I do all kinds of work. This is a medium I'd never worked in before. And then I ended up, of course, it became a thing, and you can buy them. And I have cards. This scarf is 60 bucks. <laughs> okay, so now I'm styling, I'm wearing my pants. And, um, the only thing is, they're made in Asia, so I'm a size 12, so you gotta be, you know, this is skinny for me. Um, I lost a lot of weight during treatment. So anyway, I'm, I'm ha always having a new chapter in my life. It's always time to rewrite my own history and contribute to the world. And I just want to say special thanks to Newark. I first came here in 2000 uh, with Victor, and I did Algyra. And then my friend Kevin was all over Newark, and he introduced me to everybody. And um, Cortez has been, I've been working with and showing with and, you know, performing with for years through Newark. And I just want to say special thanks to Rodney Gilbert, who died. He put me in a lot of shows, and Rodney was a lot of fun. He certainly sure was. He was a Rodney lot was of Rodney fun, was. and I loved being in all those shows. And this is my favorite place to show. We have the best artist talks, and I've talked to him. You perform with artists? I do another part of my work called the Pookie Prey. The pookie means vagina in Filipino, and it's another way of uh, reclaiming history when we invaded Iraq. Uh, the work in Iraq, and I teach in museums, the museum was bombed and looted. And you know, I was just devastated. And uh, a goddess to the goddess, because I worship the goddess, this is the goddess actually, the goddess Inanna, or Ishtar, which is on the Babylonian Gate, which is in Germany, Berlin. And um, I worship her, and I do etchings that are about um, the intersection between myth and history. For example, when the Philippines, when there was a revolution, and his mother said, don't come, you're going to be beheaded. And we were like, we bought the tickets already. So we went to the Philippines, and um, his mother was always telling us we were going to be beheaded. And, and she was like, don't come, be beheaded. But of course, me, you know, I always wanted to be in the revolution. So it turns out, this is how they do revolutions in developing nations. One uncle of his was running guns for the dictator. The other uncle of his was running guns for the revolution, right? It was a big family. You know, so, you know, I went and got to meet the revolutionaries in the jungle, and they're like, what are you doing here? I'm like, well, I always wanted to be in the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> but the etching, the etching is about, it was this amazing thing. The dictator had taken sacred tribal land and built a monument uh, to himself on this indigenous land, and during the revolution, the indigenous people went on top of the statue and sacrificed pigs to purify the ground, and the blood ran all down the statue and pooled in his eyes. And so my etching is about that. In, my etchings are about that intervention between myth and history. When you break history right open, and maybe you see a point where you can sort of change the world through culture. 
So I had this Filipino goddess and, and the, the head. And there was a moment like that in Haiti. And, and this particular etching, Inanna, this was about a rat. And we do a pookie parade, which is another bunch of work I do, where we take a culture, the, the vagina, in Filipino it's pookie. Um, she intervenes in this sacred march that we do, where we carry my pookies on banners, <laughs> and we dress up as fake, fake religious people, and we pray around war monuments to purify them, or honor, like, say, a private garden. And, you know, what, anyway, that's what we do. And it's, it's participatory. You know, everybody makes up their own thing. And Cortez is really good. <laughs> Actually, I'm pulling up a picture. I'm going to pass it around so people can see what you thought. Oh, well, anyway, we, we're, we've made several movies you can find online. Like, I've done the Pookie Parade in 20 places around the world. Brazil, uh, Chile, um, Berlin. Uh, we've done it in Brooklyn. We've done it in New Jersey. We've done it uh, in London, Liverpool, several South times. Um, yeah, Chile. Well, and now we're putting together... My nephew, who turns out to be a genius at editing, uh, 14 parades that have never been edited. We've done one in Newark, too, uh, which Cortez was in. Oh, this is so nice. So this is like, my, of course, the best one was in Newark. Uh, <laughs> that happened during the Rihanna yeah. concert. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah, oh, that's always so many people. You lost it. Well, they're on YouTube. If you Google, I think, well, is it Reynolds and Art? Yeah. Everything's under my name, Reynolds and Art. And Google the Pookie Parade, you should be able to find it. There's a couple of them. I've done it in Rome. Um, that one's up. Um, anyway, the, the Newark one is presently in the Grand Pookie Parade, which is called the Pookie Panopka. <laughs> Okay, we need more uh, performance artists in the room. I think that's just awesome. Oh, it was great. We need more of you guys. Yes. Yeah, it was great. Because everybody gets to do their own thing. Yeah. You know, you have to, you carry my art on banners, but like people dress up their own ways, and each Pookie Prey honors a different sort of thing. You know, and he had curated a show. Um, We're sorry. Yes, and that's a good lead into Cortez. <coughs> oh, wait, no, not yet. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, all right. Q&A. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. No, no, that's it. That's it. No, why don't you just um, introduce another artist? Oh, okay. Love that. that was, um, we, we met once in Morristown. Yeah. But we've been social media friends. And years. Yes, I've been trying to get it into Newark for her. For a couple of years, it's her work, what she was doing at the time was huge installations, and we had to find a place for it. So, unfortunately, when I was curating a, a barrel of windows, those windows, um, the owners closed the windows, so we lost the space to show installation art. So, sorry about that. Hopefully, something else will come up. <laughs> but I'm glad she's here. I know Laura mentioned you a couple of times, and I'm glad you showed me here. Um, her grace. Her work, people who don't know, are the collages slash paintings by stories and they're basically on, on the fence when you walk into the right. And then she has some, a few on, on board, on the wood. Beautiful. Beautiful work and she's going to talk about who she, her. For people who don't know her, especially non-family members. <laughs> <laughs> And My family knows I'm an open book, so <laughs> everything. Um, and all the way from South Jersey. South Jersey. I'm originally from, uh, born in East Orange, went to, lived in Irvington, went to school in Newark, uh, then went back to Irvington. Joya uh, and I went to school together, we graduated high school. Four long, hard years at the Catholic school of Pride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, it was a pleasure to be given the opportunity to come back home. Um, and this is 
for all purposes, it is my home. Um, like I said, I, uh, when I first came here, I was I always got misty because my sister lived right on Grove, and my father, who died five years ago, he used to buy his plumbing supplies right there on the corner mm -hmm. there. So it was like coming home. It was like wow, I'm back. <laughs> So, uh, uh, I am a visual artist. I consider myself a mixed media artist. Uh, I do some performance, um, some photography. Now I'm into printmaking. Uh, I, like I said, I originally went to school in um, Irvington. I graduated from Essex Catholic Girls High School. Uh, then I moved with my family to Central Jersey. And I kind of always was artsy. <laughs> I started off with uh, Parsons School of Design, where I went for one year. And then I uh, had my son. And I kind of was that artsy person. You know that person on your job? Oh, we got to decorate for so-and-so's birthday. Or can you make the cake? <laughs> or can you um, do a diaper cake? I was that chick. I was that one that you went to and you knew it was going to be gorgeous and fabulous. Uh, I did event planning on the side, so I was always artsy. And I had met my husband, who's also from North Jersey, and uh, he, um, we actually met at our event. And uh, it was just when I was putting my feet back into painting. And uh, it was funny because the first thing he said was, well, you do human resources, but you really are really good at art. You should go back to school for it. I was like, mm, I ain't got no time for that. I'm a kid, I got bills to pay. <laughs> so, uh, I was like, I got no time for that. And then he, he, he really stepped up and he said, listen, let me worry about the bills. You go back to school. And everyone thought he's crazy. And I went back to school and I graduated from Rutgers with a dual degree in studio art and uh, art, African American art history with a minor in museum studies. And then I found out that I don't like kids enough to teach them. <laughs> <laughs> so me with your young children was not going to be in the mood at all. Things that would go through my head, I would be arrested for. So I said, let me go back to school and get my bigger letters and teach the adult kids. So I went back and I got my degree, my MFA, and she also pushed me. She was really a pain in the butt. You talking you talking about me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I, she, she I didn't up. I didn't know I was involved. Yes, you were. But she was like, Yeah, I'm going back for my masters. I was like, Why would you do something like that? Are you crazy? That's a lot of work. And she was like, Well, you know, you get more money and I don't want to I was like and then she went and did it and of course we always went up in each other, so I was like, Oh yeah, she can do what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I enrolled in a low residency program because I still had a family and I should have known I was in trouble the first weekend I went to school. And uh, Newark native, Nell Painter, who I adore, uh, she wrote a great book uh, called um, Painting, uh, what is it, Old? Old in Art School. Old in Art School. Uh. And mm. if that is not the gospel truth when it comes to grad school, <laughs> because Literally the first day I was setting up my studio and they're showing us the building and they took us to the eighth floor at University of the Arts in Philadelphia and they show us this room and it's like a padded room and I'm like, why is it just a chair and a table in here? And they said, and this is the special room, it's our quiet room. It's for after you have a very tough crib and you may be a little tense. <laughs> and I was like, Okay, we <laughs> have a padded room. What are they going to be telling us in these prints? And I had one and I was in the padded room. <laughs> they, would, they had like stuff that you could throw. It was wonderful. But uh, so I made it through art school and I, like tough and persevered. And um, then all of 
of a sudden, out of the blue, like I did my thesis and I was like, wow, I think I'm on to something. All this other stuff they said I was doing was crap, but they don't know what I'm doing now and I can make it like it's really something. <laughs> and I really liked what I was doing and then I had my big thesis show and the next thing I know, this article was written and then that article was written and next thing you know, I'm in this magazine and then newspapers and TV shows, it was just crazy. So um, I'm just kind of like riding the wave and creating and it's so nice uh, to be an artist where you can sit back and just say, listen, um, I get up in the morning and yeah, I have my little part-time job where I teach at the college, but I know tonight I get to go in the studio and make <laughs> stuff for a good couple of hours. You know, there's nothing better than that to say every day I know I'm going to be doing something I love to do. So that's the best part. It, well, 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 tell us about um, how you became, I guess, a uh, collages. Is that a word? Collages. <laughs> I call them wood collages. Um, um, yeah, I mean, they're great stories. And, and when may you start creating on wooden fences? That's interesting. Yeah, what happened was, what happened was, <laughs> yeah. um, I started off with actually <laughs> creating sculptures with hair. And my mother law can attain to this. She sat in the, the hair chair. And um, I had done all these creations with hair. And my family looked at it like it was crazy, but my teachers were like, wow, this is like the best thing ever. And I'm looking at them like, I slapped and crocheted hair onto a wooden chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm gonna go with that. Go with that. <laughs> so uh, after a while, when you're doing one thing and you get to a point where there's nowhere else to go, mm -hmm. you have to look at something else. And lo and behold, the recreation of many faces had just came out with Denzel. Mm -hmm. um, so I watched the movie, and I had always loved the play. I had seen the play years ago. and. I was really frustrated because I had a very bad crit. And this was after I tried to get away from the hair and I was doing paper bags and all this other stuff, trying to deal with colorism and um, trying to find my place. And I looked at the fences and I'm like, and he said that line. He said, you know, love, this fence, this fence keeps other people out, but it keeps me in. And I said, ha ha. <laughs> of a fence. And so our neighbor had taken down their old wooden fence. So I had my husband drag it into the house and <laughs> I cleaned it down as best as I could. If I didn't know then what I know now. <laughs> but I cleaned it down and it took me weeks to just find the right medium to at least adhere in the paper to the fences. First I started painting. And the painting was cool, but it wasn't, I felt that my painting skills were very good, but I didn't feel they were as authentic as I would have liked them to be, to be able to go on fences. And then I saw other people painting on fences. I was like, oh, that's been done. I was like, I can go better. And so uh, I saw Whitfield Lavelle's work, and he was drawing on the wood, and I said, and then I saw another artist, someone else had um, recommended to me, Danny Simmons, he recommended to me this um, collage artist, uh, Naja Dorsey. He said, look at his work, I think there's something in it. And I was like, hmm. So I took the paper and I tried to do transfers, like gel transfers. And it doesn't always work on all fences because they're so dark. But when I just was able to put the paper down, it took me about a good month before I figured out the right medium to use to adhere and how to adhere it where it looked like it was part of the wood. Mm -hmm. But once I got it, I got it and I liked the way it looked. And once I got that feedback from my advisors and my faculty, they were like, whoa, this is something we have never seen before. You really need to run with this. And I love collage now. It's like most of the, the best part about collage is finding the images. Yeah. That's the best part. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's like, and then someone gives you a cool photo and you're like, oh, 
immediately in your head, you're like, okay, what story am I going to tell? How am I going to manipulate this? How am I going to change this? And um, that's where I ran. And now that I've got it down to a science on how to adhere it, um, I can't tell you guys because I'd have to kill you. Um, but once I got it to a science on how to adhere it, then it was just a matter of, okay, I got it. It's done. It's easy. Um, no problem at all. So I can do wood, I can do um, uh, encaustic, I do wax sometimes, so it's really cool. Okay. Well, the title, what was the, the title of the show is Her Grace. Um, what does that mean to you as far as the, um, the art world? Uh, I think that women uh, artists right now are having that moment of grace, which is wonderful. Uh, we've been overlooked for so long in the art world. Uh, nothing against my brothers, <laughs> but uh, if I've, I've had even instances where you know uh, you go to a gallery or space and they're like, "Oh well, we have our female artists." And I'm like, "For real? You can't have more than one. You can, you've got your female artists." Or we've got so and so, and they'll mention the person's name, and you'll be like, okay, obviously they're an artist of color. You mean to say you can't have more than one? You know. Mm -hmm. So it, it it it's so nice now to see other artists like Simone Lay and Vanessa Jordan mm -hmm. and Deborah Roberts and um, Bisa and all of them out there doing their thing and getting recognized for bringing that feminine stories that a lot of times overlook. Um, I always think back to that saying of, um, I think it was W.E.B. Du Bois who said, um, if, you don't, if we don't tell our own stories, other people are going to tell their story narrative. We have to own our own narratives. And that's all my artwork is about, owning our narratives. So. Just for people who don't know, um, this you can Google this. This is what's going on now. The African American women artists are just yeah. sh shooting up. So buy them now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was but, listed top yeah. ten best emerging female artists in the United States. Excellent. So, yeah. two yeah. so. I told the story last time. We have a local artist named Bisa Butler. Yeah. My girl. A couple years ago, she she did a show in Orange. She was selling her pieces for a thousand, fifteen hundred. You know, to us it was like, oh, that's kind of expensive. <laughs> but now she's at eighty, a hundred. You know, she's all over the world. She has a three hundred. I just saw her today. She has a three hundred people backlog. Mm -hmm. Michelle Obama one. It's in her, it's in her list. Oh, they want her work. So I should have bought it for a thousand dollars. I got one. I don't know about you. <laughs> She's having a good trade, but still. Yeah. But anyway, please buy the emerging artists at this level. You know, um, just in case, especially her. She shoots yeah, up. Yeah, because now it, 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 I I tell a lot of young collectors um, when I do visiting artists things, I tell them, listen, everyone's like, oh, that's rent. <laughs> that's a car payment. Yeah, but your car devalued as soon as you took it off the lot. Uh, don't let the space that the artwork is in intimidate you. Don't let the price intimidate you. It's just like back in the day when we used to go to Valley Fair and put the Christmas stuff on layaway. Artists do layaway. You can know that, right? You know, the galleries will work with you and be like, listen, just pay a little at a time. And then you have something that you can have forever, something that you can pass on to your kids, your grandkids. It's something that's forever. Or sell. After, or sell. After 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Hey, look at Diddy. He just bought Kerry James Marshall for mm -hmm. 128 mil. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, hey. And then my favorite story Blondie. What were you guys? Remember Blondie? The, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Basquiat. Yeah. She bought a Basquiat for $200 <laughs> back in the 80s. $200 for a Basquiat. If you, who knows Basquiat, he's done it for him. Hundred million right now. You know, I think it's been thirty years, but still, she still has it for two hundred dollars. So, yeah, you never know what could happen if you buy a piece of her. Sell it. 
Yeah, I have a friend that bought this from um, yeah. Romary Bearden, oh, and she got it for fifty dollars. And she said it was way in the back in his house, and he had totally overlooked it. Fifty dollars, and she said she can't even guess what the price would be at all. So, so keep that in mind. If you want to tell your friend, family and friends about art, um, just keep that in mind. This, thank you. You're We're gonna move on. Let's try Curtis here. Reason. Um, his work is, as soon as you walk in, it's to your left. Mm -hmm. All right, a little bit up to the left. Mm -hmm. so, oh, yeah, and then remind me of Al Neal, yeah, go every year. Um, Revelations, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's really the cry. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, really? I didn't know they had a yeah. yeah. cry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Curtis is our uh, next speaker. Wait, tell us about himself. And, uh, okay. Uh, yes, my name is Curtis Grayson III, um, artist from Newark, uh, art educator, so over 20 years as far as art education. I love kids. Love, <laughs> love kids, love teaching kids. Uh, I, teach, I, teach at, I teach at Columbia High School, I teach AP Studio Art right now currently. Um, I teach for 20 years. Um, I also I graduated from Arts High School in Newark, so right here, um, you know, from the bricks. Also graduated from William Patterson University. Um, I have similar as far as path stories as far as like the Levet. I mean, my first my first degree as far as an African Studies degree from William Patterson, and then I went on to get my um, my studio art degree, bachelor's from um, William Patterson University. And hopefully soon next year we'll go into my low res program myself for MFA, uh, so I can teach at a college level. Um, a lot of my work as far as definitely um, storytelling. Um, a lot of some of the images I have, I have some abstracts that's here now. I have some abstracts and some of my figurative works. Um, the abstracts are more newer works that I'm working on. I'm having a, a ball of just, of just creating, sculpting. It's like putting puzzles together. I'm using a lot of fabric, a lot of different materials that I'm mixing and matching, and putting pieces together. Focusing on a lot of movement in my paintings, a continuous movement in the painting so that it's, it's always an infinity, constantly moving and your eyes constantly just rotating throughout the painting. Um, one of the pieces that I have that's on this wall here, it's um, titled uh, La Pieta. It's actually a tribute from Michelangelo's piece, a sculpture piece of the Madonna, of, of actually Mary when they took Jesus down off the cross. Um, what I had was I had, I wanted to show a more contemporary style of showing of a young black male that didn't realize as far as that his pride and as far as him being a king and he was he was he was he was murdered. So basically it's a tribute as far as to women that have lost their children as far as the gun violence. In the piece there's a stained glass that represents as far as the church that shows that you have the church and then you also have this woman holding her son in his lifeless body. He's in the same exact position as Jesus was when Mary was holding him when he was coming off the cross. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to really touch on to show that youth, uh, so I had them with a tank top on, jeans, a Jordan, just so some kids can make, make the connection to it. Um, there's a yellow police tape that's going in the back of it. It's showing also that we're not, it's, it's the symbolism, we're not safe in our mosques, our synagogues, or our churches. You know, these are the places where we thought that we could be safe, we could be sacred, and violence is still following us through, the, through those days here. Um, so, you know, usually like now, um, I'm always telling the story. Um, anytime I work and I paint, I only go to my canvas, I only go to my easel, easel when I'm at peace. I never go, there's some artists, they go and they paint anytime, but I never enter that area, that space when I'm unbalanced. Because it is like, a, it is like to me, it's like a mirror. Whatever I put in, that energy is going to reflect out. That's why a lot of times people, when they see my work, they say they feel a good feeling from the work. They get a good energy from the, either the color palettes that we use. Um, so they just make that connection from there. Um, like right now, like I said, with my abstracts I'm doing, um, that's really starting to get a lot of attention. Um, I, I do a lot of larger pieces. Um, the, the work that I'm doing the abstracts on are uh, papers coming from the Philippines it's called Bird's Nest. Bird's Nest paper. It's a very um, fibrous paper, very thick, very hard to work on. I'm sculpting on it. I'm creating a painting on it as well. It's very, a lot of texture. A lot of texture that usually comes in there, like brown, burgundy, um, and also like a hunter green. Um, so I think uh, actually Laura, she has some medium-sized pieces, but I also have some very larger pieces of those as well that we work on. Um, but I, I use a lot of different fabrics. We're very, 
uh, colorful people as far as you know when we actually when we work when we when we dress there's a lot of rhythm in anything we do so I like to show that um, myself being as far as like a, a black studies major I was very much in tune as far as studying people seeing as far as how we interact seeing as far as how the black family is or just seeing how we're studied in life and so I just I always take time to just take that small little idea of looking at detail, critical detail as far as how we are as people, how people perceive us. And my role sometimes, even like listening to a lot of my professors, where my early years, I'm in my 30th year painting now, if you can believe that or whatever, I'm, I still kind of look a little young, hopefully. <laughs> God, 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 God willing, I'm on the, on, the, on the wood, but in two months or whatever, I'll be 50. So I'm, you know, I'm pushing at 50. I have, I have three sons, uh, 21, 19, and, and 10. So, so I have three boys and everything. Um, but, you know, they are always, you know, trying to push the, the images of positivity. Um, you know, started in my early, my bio or whatever, I always used to say, you know, you know, for my, and I'm dating myself because my favorite sitcom was Good Times back in the day when I was young. But seeing as far as JJ painting in his studio in the house or whatever, I said to my mother, I said, that's going to be me. I'm going to have me an easel. I'm going to be painting in my living room, and this is what I want to do. And then, of course, as you start getting educated, start learning, whatever, that J.J. was not the artist. He was the actor, but it was the work of Ernie Barnes. Mm -hmm. So that gave, as far as more information about his work and pr promoted more his work. Same as far as later, by that time when I was in college, entering college, you had the Cosby shows there. So that did what great things for black artists of exposure of now people wanted images, positive images, looking like a, a mini museum in their homes, in their works. So I look at as far as myself, as I teach and I tell my students, um, I've uh, acquired a, a, a quite a bit of um, collectors that have been collecting my work you know, over the time. Um, I've changed two to three different types of websites. At one time, early on, used to list my collectors on there, but then I kind of changed that because I was like, I want people to like my work because they like my work, not collect because they see who's who has been collecting my work. Mm -hmm. So let the work speak for itself. So I took that down and we changed some things up and constantly keep, you know, pushing the work out there now. Um, but like I always tell my students, I say, you know, I'm not famous, but if you Google me, you will, you will see my name pop up. <laughs> if, you, if you know about The Best Man Holiday, um, I had seven pieces of my film, my work in that film. If you look at um, Decision, um, Disappearing Acts with uh, Terry Millen and um, Wesley Snipes, uh, Sanaa Lathan, I had one of my pieces that was featured in that film or whatever from there. So, you know, the work has been getting out there. People, are, and, so, and I always tell artists, it's important to constantly keep creating your work. Even if people are overlooking you, somebody's watching you. And so what happens is, if you stay local, then people will always say, oh, well, that's Curtis work. I can see his work. I can get it anytime. But when you start traveling out, representing your city and going other places and getting written up as far as in magazines or newspapers and articles and different things, now other people start taking notice. Then people say, well, maybe I should follow his work. Maybe I should take the time and try to, you know, buy a piece of, of, of his work and everything. And, you know, that's what's been happening as far as, you know, from, you know, just, you know, major collectors or having work uh, produced as far as, you know, in major publications, as far as uh, the McDonald's Gospel Fest, uh, and, um, pretty much, you know, a lot of different ways we can try to expose and have work. Have work as far as working in, uh, at the museums or whatever, or having um, murals, having my work, you know, in some murals or whatever, different places. So it's different places where artists can show their work. I've had also some of my work produced as far as women's ponchos, so, you know, so the clothing line. So there's a lot of different ways my work is constantly keep elevating and going into different circles. And of course, with the original work and stuff here, like in Laura's gallery, it's my first time debuting at the gallery, and it's, it's been great, and I'm um, just you know, proud of it. What grace means to me, grace is pretty much um, something that is given, but we haven't actually appreciated or actually earned, as far as what grace is or whatever. Grace is, I, I think of grace, grace is the majesty as far as, you know, something regal, royal, or what we have, or what we could, you know, obtain. You know, as, as artists, I always say we need to be able to, you have a choice. You have a choice of either you can create work for yourself, or you can create work about things that's happening around you. Because historically, people will always go back and say, well, what was being done by the visual artists 
when all of these things are happening, you know, around the world or things that's happening in their neighborhoods. So this is like the record of time. These are these are things that's frozen in time of how they're depicting of what's telling the story. Remember what happens historically. I'm a historic, I'm a history major. So when there was any type of turmoil or any type of revolution or any type of wars, the first thing they do is they burn the libraries, the museums, and they loot and they take everything. So they destroy the books, they destroy as far as the works, or they take the works or whatever and claim them for themselves. So these are the things that what happens. People see our work and they see what we do and it makes a difference. You know, when, you know, our mm -hmm. sometimes until you really understand about your country or about your culture, you have to step outside of it and read other papers, other magazines of how the world is viewing here. You know, right here in Newark, this is like one of the little meccas, you know, as much as, you know, people will may talk about, this is why people are constantly still flushing and coming into our city because they see the, the potential here. And, you know, and as an artist, we just need to be able to show that. We need to be able to reflect that as far as, you know, in our work. Um, but I, like I said, I always find different ways to visualize my work. From earlier on when I did a lot of my Alvin Ailey pieces, when I go to see a performance, I see the work, I see the performances. I'm thinking of ways I can paint. I'm thinking of ways I can just focus off from there. So you, you, you switched over from figurative art to abstract, right? What, what, what was the trigger that made you switch over to abstract? Not really completely transforming or, or because I still do my figurative. I do a lot of, um, I consider myself as far as, I love, um, artists that inspired me like uh, Romeo Bearden and Jacob Lawrence and Picasso. From those three, they had a lot of various different styles. If I compare that to like a musician or whatever, I can say like someone as far as like, like a Jay-Z or Kar Karis One. They had so many different styles that they can choose, so you're never bored. Same as far as with me as a visual artist or whatever, so my figurative, if I want to do a lot of jazz things, I go into my jazz, my jazz styles. I can go from there. Then I can, if I want to go into my religious images, then I want to do my more churches, I'll, I have that path. Now I have in my abstracts, so now I'm just flowing when I want to take a break from figurative. So it's not really that I'm retired from figurative. I still, I still do that every day. I'm teaching figure drawing and portraits or whatever today with my students. And so I still, I'm still connected with that, you know, uh, with figurative. Uh, but now, it's now I'm moving more into like some of the abstract. And my thing is I'm trying to control my own category and, and uh, my own destiny because what happens is like in America a lot of times they want to categorize, they want to pigeon toes you and say okay you need to be this artist so we can categorize and put a little label on you. So they want to focus on you're here, I need you here, I need you here. But it, what happens if someone is like this and they can uh, navigate through all then they should be even multitasking, you know, or multifaceted as far as in their styles. So next will be performance for you. Possibly. I mean, I was a musician. I, was a musician. I don't, I don't performance know. Performance art. Okay. <laughs> we need Maybe. more of those in New York. Maybe. I'm just planning to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, um, Curtis, for that. Uh, we we'll go to Cortez. Um, Cortez piece is uh, the one right there by. By the window? It's the door, it's called Reveal. Reveal, okay. okay. And I created that right before a show that I curated, which Reynolds was in, called Misogyny is the Root of All Evil. And Misogyny is the Root of All Evil came into play when a friend of mine, we would have these conversations, and she would call me out on my misogyny. And I always thought of myself as being enlightened. But she reminded me very quickly that I was socially conditioned to be a misogynist. And so in that came this piece, and it's called Reveal because um, a fellow artist and poet, Rochelle Miller, was looking at the painting as I was doing it, and she wrote this poem called Reveal. I'm not a poet, so I'm not going to recite it. <laughs> and so... Um, <laughs> So that's what that piece is. And the piece actually started with the image that's sideways, the woman right there up top. And it started there in just a free flow. When, whenever I paint, I, I like to, I call it a visual freestyle. 
I like to hit the canvas and not really have an idea of what I'm doing as far as subject matter and kind of just free flow with it. Um, one of my favorite artists was, um, or is still, Keith Hammond, and he was very good at just taking a marker, taking a, a spray paint can, and hitting a canvas or a wall and starting in the center or starting off to the edge and just filling the whole thing. And it was this consistent flow. So I really love, and that's why I have a, a lot of black lines in my um, work because of the whole um, love of graffiti art. So for me, art started back when my mother used to have fashion magazines and art magazines laying around the house and her favorite painter was Picasso and um, Andy Warhol. So through that, and also her collecting African art, it kind of fused in with my also being involved with um, DJ culture. So for me, I guess it was the 80s when I started getting into art and so you had all these elements from MTV, you had graffiti going on, um, I'm out in the clubs, and this whole mishmash of pop culture, fashion, and I wanted to do it all. And that was, that, that was the strange thing, and my father used to always say to me, you need to focus on one thing. And throughout my career, I always tapped into different things. It was like the music influenced the art, the art influenced the music, and it all fed each other. And it wasn't until, I would say, the last like, 20 years where my, my father since passed, but he pulled me to the side and said, I get it. I totally get it. And if you look at media now, it's bits and pieces of a little bit of everything to sell one thing. And not, and not to say that my art is to sell one thing, but it's, it's a little bit of a lot of things, and it just filters into what you see on canvas. And so in choosing this painting for this show, I wanted to submit something that was in line with um, the feminine energy. And so it also went back to misogyny is the root of all evil. And so with that whole concept, if you look at all of the issues in the world today, it's caused by men. I hate to say it, but it's caused by men. And if a woman, a woman is involved, it's usually because she's trying to be like her male counterpart, or she's trying to take on that false notion of manhood. So in a sense, looking at misogyny as the root of all evil, it's also about looking at the definition of manhood. And so when I have these conversations with women, it's like preaching to the choir. I actually need to be speaking to men because what's so called, what's, what we call women's issues, it's actually men's issues. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's a, a topic that I find um, very interesting when I speak to men because a lot of people don't like to admit they're wrong. And so in, in having these conversations, I really think it's up to us men to take the bull by the horn and make the changes we need to, to make this world a better place for all of us and especially for our women. You create, you create a <laughs> Women issues, besides this piece, your whole practice? Um, not solely women's issues, okay. um, social. I, I like touching on social commentary. Mm -hmm. um, I love the women's point of view. Or no, no, from my point of view. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> from my point of view. And um, at time, I don't like to speak for one particular group, it's just addressing things from my perspective and in hopes of opening up a conversation. Okay. You consider yourself more of an abstract artist? I've been um, doing abstract lately, but I would consider myself just an artist.
again, I don't want the label. You know, even the notion of being called a black artist, it's interesting because you don't call Picasso a white artist. And then it goes back to the whole notion of um, social, um, what's the word? Um, I was about to say social commentary, but social conditioning. The whole idea of whiteness is a made-up construct. Mm -hmm. And so, <laughs> me being a black artist, it, it's like I'm kind of forced to address so-called black issues. But if you look at black issues, they're humanity mm -hmm. issues. Yeah. You know, you look at women's issues, they have humanity issues. But again, it goes back to the labels. It's easy to categorize you know, what you're speaking about or what you're looking at or what you're listening to. Okay. Well, thank you. One more item we have a few more. Um, my name is Joel Lopez. Um, I'm originally from Patterson, and I came to Newark six years ago to be part of the Newark art scene because Patterson did not have an art scene. Um, and Newark embraced me, which was very um, beautiful of them. No, no they, they look not kind of the strangers. Oh, carpetbaggers, as they call them, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but they embraced me. So, um, my work, my work is this one right here, the yellow lady, um, and then the flower flowers and then the other one next to it. I just want to talk about this one. 2016, I did a show at the Faro um, Gallery titled Speaking in Tongues, which was um, my story about me. I was, a, I was an evangelical Christian for 25, 27 years. I mean, like heavy duty evangelical Christian. Church every day, Bible study. I was out there in the streets preaching, if you don't give up your heart to the Lord, we go to hell. I was one of those. <laughs> and it was just, my world was the Christian faith. So what I'm going to say, please, if you're a Christian, I'm not trying to offend you. It's just my view. Uh, so I, I created a series um, for my solo show called Speaking in Tongues. And this was one of them. Um, she's a Virgin Mary. A couple of things. She's a woman of color. Because growing up, <laughs> I always thought that Jesus Christ was Puerto Rican. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> same thing as Santa Claus, because you know we saw Channel Forty One and Forty Seven, which were like the Spanish stations, mm -hmm. and they were had to ad lib in Spanish. So you know Jesus Christ was Spanish. Mm -hmm. so, so did Moses, mm -hmm. all this stuff. So I always thought that um, my God, or Jesus Christ, and the whole family, you know, the whole family of Christians were people of color like me. So I make sure I made her. Um, of a woman of color. Um, second thing about that piece is that Christians don't believe in luck. They believe in faith. Right? So you no longer, you know, don't play the lottery, <laughs> don't gamble. <laughs> um, God is going to buy <laughs> I always like my pastor for the numbers, but he never gave it to me. Um, but that will provide according to the Christian faith. So, I make sure that she uh, crosses her fingers when she's praying to, um, you know, this is a sign of luck, like, hopefully. So that she's praying. She's praying to God for a couple of things, or two things. Either she's pregnant, or she's not pregnant. <laughs> now, the reason that you can say that is because around her are EBT test devices. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says that. So, but so she, she either had all those tests <laughs> and they were negative because she didn't have the sex, or she's she been she had all those tests wanting to get pregnant. By God, um, you know the story. So I just want to make fun. Um, again, once I left the Christian faith, it was just I thought about it like wow, I spent my whole life. I should have went to grad school. You know. I went to Bible school, um, but I went to grad school and, you know, made some money. <laughs> Instead of went to Bible school, and I, was, I was just made fun of, trying to make fun of a lot of Christian stories that I thought were just a little weird, you know, like the virgin birth. Again, I apologize if, if you believe this. Um,
So that's, that's, that was my practice back in 2016. Um, I do a lot of work, it's heavy commentary about social issues. So it, was, it got too heavy for me. I stopped watching the news. I mean, I don't want to hear about politics. I don't even want to vote. I'm serious, I'm, I'm at that point. It's just so frustrating. So I decided to just create something, something beautiful. So I created um, some flowers. Just, no story to them, there's nothing about them, just beautiful. Somebody gives you some beautiful flowers and you, you're grateful. You put flowers in your home, you, they make you happy. So that's all I wanted to do, just to cleanse me, clean, just clean me from all that, what's going on. I have to go back to common, you know, social commentary eventually, like we all do. We all got to vote, we all got to do adult stuff. <laughs> yeah. right? Right? <laughs> but once in a while, we just want to just chill. We just want to just chill. So as an artist, I know we just like we say we just want to just relax. So that's what the purpose of my um, I guess the flowers. Well, I'll talk real quick about the one next to it. <laughs> the one next to it on uh, the wall, uh, his name is She. S H E. Um, I'm gonna call him a drag queen. He's a drag queen. On the other side, next to the flowers, um, I'm gonna call him a drag queen because back in the '60s they were called drag queens. Um, now they're called transgenders, right? I think some are still trans. Yeah. 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 Well, he was a transgender because he was a... <laughs> At the time, there was no transgender. The, the men right. knew what... Right. Yeah. right. So, okay, so let's call him... Right. Or was he a cross-dresser? No, he was a... He, was a, <laughs> he became a... Mm -hmm. really. Okay, that's transgender. Okay, so let's call him transgender. But at the time, it was drag queen. He, his name was uh, Sylvia Rivera. Um, he was part of... The Young Lords, people don't know the Young Lords. Mm -hmm. They're the same thing as um, Black Panthers, yeah. you know, the Puerto Rican kind in, in the barrio. Felipe Luciano. Yes, yeah, he was part of, the, he's in history, she, I'm sorry, Sylvia Rivera is in history books, being a drag queen in the Young Lords. He was also, she was also, I'm sorry, part of the Stone Road, Stone, Stone, ah, Stone Wall of the Lights. We have a show at the Brooklyn Museum about this. Yes. Well, what's the other ones? Um, it's called oh, I Never Promise You Tomorrow. Yeah. And, and that person is the star. That person's history. Yeah. And there's an article over here. Um, excuse me? Is it, is it, the, is it the guy you used to? Sylvia. It's Sylvia. Yes. Yeah. That's the river. That's right. yeah. Yes, yes, that's the that's one. Right. But the most important thing about her that I love is that she lived at a time back in the 60s and 70s. Greenwich Village had a pier. Right. It was very seedy. You know, you remember. She lived in a cardboard box in the pier. She was an alcoholic. She was a drug addict. I think she was also, at the time, HIV positive. Mm -hmm. time. So she had all these strikes against her. Uh, but she started an organization called STAR, S T A R. And that organization helped other transgender women of color, you know, with services. Mm -hmm. Whatever, health, food, whatever. That fascinated me. I'm like, she's yeah. poor, living in a box. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Have all these strikes against her, but she started an organization that still uh, is, 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 I think it's in West Side of Manhattan. Lower, Lower East Side. Lower East Side is still going on now. Yeah. Uh, they had a whole building. Yep, the back Silver, Silver River Project. So that, that was fascinating. When I found out about her, that fascinated me. I just wanted to put that on campus um, um, just for that reason. So anyway, that's, that's the kind of work I do. Um, um, I'm, I'm, that's basically it um, about me and about us. But we have um, oh, Grace. Oh, Grace. Grace. <laughs> what Grace means to me, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think mothers have like this amazing love for children and, and people. And I didn't know that until my brother had a child. And, and I just looked at them like, loved them unconditionally. I don't have any children, but I love them unconditionally. I can see why mothers, kids can do anything, and mothers like still love them. Just like this unconditional love. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, okay, okay. <laughs> y'all do, y'all do. I don't care what y'all say, y'all do. I mean, y'all know my mother. You're psycho killer. The yeah. mother loves the psycho. It's a traditional yeah. <laughs> And, and that's a, something I learned in the church as far as God's love, you know, as far as um, the Bible, te the Holy Bible's teaching is that God loves that people the same way, like unconditional. There's no, there's nothing you can do or say 
that's going to change my love towards you. And I think that's what women do. Um, I mean, they love their men like that. They love their children like that. They love um, their, each other, you know, you know, sisters like that. There's something about you know, women's grace that um, it's open. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, I can't even explain it. I wish I could paint it. I that's where I would be a millionaire. It's a challenge. <laughs> I do have to say, I do, I do with the pinky, uh, Madonna's are about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I was brought up a Christian too, not so evangelist. I think the Episcopal Church thinks is much more broad minded and has yeah. gay, gay priests and out gay priests. But I did not believe in the virgin birth. And to me, you know, I did, I felt like I could see, I can feel that love shine across the centuries, mm -hmm. right? That to me is what's most powerful about that myth. And she made it up, okay? She would have gotten stoned if she had admitted she had sexual intercourse. So she made up this whole story, and her love shines across the centuries with this completely fabricated story made to protect herself and her son, and I did feel that love when my son was born, and I, so I paint the Pookie Madonnas with a revealed vagina, to reveal the hidden in this history. Well, that's not what the Christian believe, as far as, I just want to defend them, although I'm not a Christian. You know, as far as the uh, Bible, well, that, that, right, the that they, they the yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm saying, their, 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 their size, that, you know, she was pregnant, they divided. Oh thing. no, I was raised in the Episcopal yeah, so, Church. It's a different. <laughs> and they believe that, and they'll fight you for it. They'll fight you. Yeah, yeah. But I understand. I, you know, I yeah. that. Um, I don't know what to believe anymore. That's where I'm at in my life. Well, but, I believe that grace is like that, that cardboard box yeah. that you're talking about. Yeah. To me, that's grace. That's grace. Thank you. Yeah. Please ask some questions. These artists are eager to answer any of your questions. <laughs> I have two questions. Yes, absolutely. This artist and this artist. Okay, you talked about yes. the, the young man. Um, you, before you told your story, that piece pulled me in. Mm -hmm. I, this is the second time I've, I've, I've seen it. I've come to the gallery before. But I couldn't figure out, because I have cert um, certain spoken word pieces about that. And I have family members that have suffered from that. But I couldn't figure out why I wasn't sad looking at it. The energy didn't bring me down. Yeah, it sure. just made me focus. And I was speaking to this young lady who I've just met. But when you described how you work, that was the connecting piece. Mm -hmm. You didn't come to that in yeah. sadness. Well, what I did was deliberately when I create that piece. At first, you know, artists, we try things out. Mm -hmm. Some things are trial and error. I knew it was very symbolic, the image, the way I shaped the body to really resemble as far as, you know, Jesus when he came off the cross. Mm -hmm. I actually put, the originally when I was starting it, I actually put a blood stain on his actual shirt. That would have been too shocking, too, um, too much impact. I didn't need it. The police tape would say, say it enough. His lifeless body with the arm dropping says it all. Um, we're going we're gonna to have that connection because of we can't go without asking any of our family members, especially like now, kids or whatever, of have you seen a gunshot wound or somebody that's been killed in your family or you know, some type of horror, horrific type of event. It's, it's gotten to the point where it's been, sometimes it becomes numb, but it's, it's, it's there. So um, I wanted to make sure, like I said, yes, two things is happening. So my energy always, I always enter the, uh, the canvas or the easel, positive energy when I get ready to create. So neg never any negative energy. But then two, like I said, I didn't want to have that extra symbolism of the blood stain on the shirt. Because then I didn't want you to get distracted from seeing that before you see the whole entire piece itself, you know. So I wanted to be able to still show there's like almost like a, a halo around his head of, you know, almost like a, a imaginary crown of thorns that he just didn't, 
He didn't even realize that he was like a young kid. Yeah, you can't, you can't leave out the grace. Of course. Because it, to me, he was so caught. Although yeah. he was limp and lifeless. Yeah, the mother still, yeah, yeah. she's she still, she and was she's it still a mother, there. was it a spirit, or was it, what was it? That, yeah, well, Female or something. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, because, because, well, it's that feminine energy. So that's that, you know, mothers already are, women already are born nurturers. So they're going to automatically, no matter what their son or daughter is doing, their first instinct is just to love. Before they even chest stop, before they go to the discipline, Love is always going to come. The first way we learn about love is from our mothers, for males or whatever. So how we relate to love for women, you learn it from your mother. So I just, I'm glad that you, because I couldn't figure it out. Right. So now I understand that and when we have time, not in this form, I'll tell you why that I connected to that piece. Okay. And if you allow me my second question. You please, you have to tell me what that adhesive is. <laughs> I promise you, I have messed up a million photographs because I'm trying to get them onto whatever. And I come back and I do my podge, but then they will. Like they. Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, <laughs> you want me to come in private? <laughs> you want me to come in private? Okay. I'll tell you the basics. When I'm looking for my fences, okay, my husband comes to this place that we get for for our fences. Uh, there'll be a stack about this high, and I tell him I want the one all the way at the bottom. <laughs> and he'll lift them all up, and he was like, you sure you want this one at the bottom? Yes, I want that one right here, second from the bottom, the, the big one. And he'll get them and he'll cut them down with a chainsaw and put them in his truck and we'll take it to my studio. And I have a lovely, oh, I love my studio. Oh, I love my studio. Because so I have a great space and part of the process, like I said, the things I learned then from now, when I picked up the, my neighbor's fences, I didn't realize there's stuff in fences that uh, you're really gonna clean out and give time before you start adding stuff on them. Like bugs, spiders, uh, poison ivy that maybe have grown on the fence and you didn't know about it because they pulled it off and the oils are still there in the wood. Yeah. I, how was I supposed to know? My husband got poisoned. Oh, cool down. So, um, I, I, my process is right into the studio. Let it sit for at least two weeks. The wood sits, and I have a vault off of my studio, separate room, and I let the wood stay in there. So anything that's creeping, crawling in there, it comes out. And then I spray it down with this concoction, and I think that's what it really is. It's a concoction I made up of water. Uh, rubbing alcohol, tea tree oil, and a little bit of hydrogen peroxide. And I spray all the wood panels down, totally. And then I let them dry. And then I spray them again. And then the real secret is there's something called orange peel concentrate. You can get it from Amazon. It comes in a big bottle. It gets rid of termites or anything that's living inside of the wood. And you dilute it and you spray down the wood again. And then I sand it. Now, mind you, this is two weeks, just to at least three weeks before I can even start adhering. Mm -hmm. um, I use part mileage podge, part matte medium that you can get from the okay, that's what I mean. And you dilute it till it's not quite a first glue thickness. And the secret is how I apply it. I apply some on the back some on the paper, and then I use vinyl nitro gloves, and I literally am working into the creases with my hands. Mm -hmm. And then I have a special kneaded tool that I use to get the grooves <coughs> in and the air bubbles out. And then I use a hot, um, a heat gun, and it works like shrinky dates. I saw <laughs> So that's the basics of it. There's other parts to it to make it look as seamless where it looks like it's painted rather than yeah. um, just attached. But that's the basics of it. And it's more of a method to it. There's like two other steps. Right? It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for...
two or three more questions. It's only 8.30. Let's take Any other questions? Just a yeah. general question. I have a general question. Um, Mr. Cortez, you mentioned that you'd like to be considered an artist. You know, when you made that comment, as opposed to a black artist, mm -hmm. when you made that comment, I thought about Toni Morrison. And I know Toni mm -hmm. Morrison on many occasions said, you know, I'm proud to be a black writer. And in Toni's case, you know, she made it very clear that when she was writing, she wrote for black people, mm -hmm. you know. And I can relate to that, and I also relate to, 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 to your notion that you just want to be considered an artist. But, you know, um, and, and, and clearly, you know, I don't think people box Toni Morrison and, you know, a little box because she considers herself to be a black artist, you know. Um, so, you know, I, what, I, what I want to ask you, why don't you, do you, do you take exception to be considered a black artist, and if so, why? And that is, it, it isn't really an mm -hmm. issue. It's um, so many times I've been in a room where I'm the only black artist, mm -hmm. and it's 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 kind of like a double-edged sword. Sometimes I'm there because I was the only black artist that they knew, and sometimes I'm there because it's it's solely on the work. But as a black person, being in um, situations where I'm the only one, sometimes I get sick of thinking about color. Honestly, I get sick of thinking about color. I mean, it's a gift. I walk into a room, I'm a black man. You know, um, I create my work as a, it's a gift, you know, in this society. But Sometimes I don't want to think about color, and I think that's why I'm going into or have been experimenting with abstract art. It's kind of nice to have something on the wall and it's, it's just about color, it's just about technique, it's just about texture, yeah. as opposed to giving this whole explanation on why the black woman's in the paint. Okay. <laughs> you know, or, 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 or Better yet, I'll, I'll have my artwork. Not so much, this isn't a good example of what I'm about to say, but I'll have a painting depicting, um, trying to think of a painting. I have this painting called Just Us, okay? And so most of the pictures are from the Million Man March. I had a black woman come up to me and she's looking at the painting and she says to me, a black woman now, she says, do you do African-American art? <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? You know, pictures of, you know, kind of, and so she started describing a Terry McMillan um, novel cover. And so it frustrates me that you're going to look at this painting where most of the images are from the Million Man March and then ask me if I do black art. Mm -hmm. you know, and part of it is, and part of the role as an artist, and I, you guys teach, we're not only creating art, we're teaching people as well. And so sometimes you get sick of teaching people, especially oh, yeah. you know, people that you think would know <laughs> or should know. should know. And so back to you know, again, the, the title, Black Artist, sometimes I just get sick of being a black artist. I have no problem with the title. <laughs> I really don't. I, I, Can you tell me why? Um, because I come from a time when I remember my first time my mother took me to the museum was North Museum, and I didn't see us there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, when I went to school, I was pleased that I was able to go, I went to Rutgers, I went to Rutgers Camden, it was a small campus, and my white teacher showed me all these incredible black artists. And I was like, well, how was I not learning about these people mm -hmm. that were there? I didn't know about Romeo Bearden or Jacob Lawrence or uh, Samuel L. Lewis. I didn't know about any of these people. And I had the pleasure that ultimate pleasure of meeting Elizabeth Catlett before she died. And 
she said to me, I asked her the same question. I said, would you consider yourself an artist? She said, I consider myself an artist, but I know the world will always call me a black artist. And she said, I, I can't do anything about that. I just want to be the best whichever I can be. And that's what I try to do. That's what I try to do in my work. That's why I mainly do themes of blackness in my work, and mm -hmm. it's unabashedly blackness. Mm -hmm. um, I try to embrace the narrative that was taken from us. Yes. Um, women's stories, uh, unlike men's stories from the Civil Rights Movement, women's stories weren't told. We didn't hear about Septima Clark, who's right there. Mm -hmm. Most people look at that picture and think it's an old woman. That's Septima Clark over there. I know this. Mm -hmm. How many people in the room know? Most of you don't. She was a civil rights activist, you know? Um, people don't know these things because our stories were taken from us. And um, I like the idea that if I want to take Septima Clark and put her with a crown of gold, copper, and bronze, you know, I can put her with that and then have maybe um, one of the girls from the Little Rock Nine walking in the background with her head held high you know, and reinvent that story and own that power back. I'm happy to, and proud to do that because if we don't tell it, other people are going to tell it for us. And that's very important to me. I, I wear that badge with honor. Mm -hmm. um, I look at the picture in the front. That's my grandmother in that picture. Um, she grew up at a time where her family, she was the lightest skinned person in her family. And she didn't was told by her grandmother, who was dark skinned, don't go off the front porch in the middle of the day because you'll get too dark. You can't go work in the fields like your cousins who are darker. I need you to work inside because we don't want you getting too dark. And the reason why was because she was the hope that she could bring up the rest of the family by going to college because she was lighter. And she had to deal with that. She had a mother that could pass and did pass often. You know, her grandmother took care of her and raised her. She was dark skinned. She kept her inside. You know, so I tell these stories because it's so important to tell those stories. And I don't mind being the person that has to educate you. Because a lot of times the people that look at my work are people of another color. I mostly show in Philadelphia. I show a lot in the South and out West. Mm -hmm. And most of my clients are Caucasian. And they love it. And they say, because our kids don't learn these stories in the school. Just like we're telling our kids, of uh, saying we didn't learn these stories, their kids aren't learning these stories. And they want their That's kids to learn point. these yeah. stories. Mm -hmm. You know, so if they got in the house, it's better. To add on to like what you're questioning, what you're asking as far as you know, Joelle as myself, um, as like artists, as far as some artists will take on that burden or that hat as far as I'm a black artist. But notice whatever of how the dynamics is being played as well, because of if you look at some artists that are hitting the pinnacle or whatever, like Carrie James Marshall, uh, Jean Michel Basquiat. Um, they're being categorized not as a black artist, as an American artist. Mm -hmm. So what happens or whatever now, it creates more of a worldly opening as far as view, as far as how you're associated, who's your target audience or whatever, that you're not just in just a small area, a small box. Yes, even though from the 60s and the 70s to that 80s, 90s, whatever, of the, the black art movement has been taken on and some artists will take that notion of I'm going to be the black artist or I'm going to put that black burden on my back to tell the stories or to be able to share as far or they're going to like it because you're a black art 